Johnson. Welcome to this new series here on Trinity TV. As we talk with the Archbishop, His Grace, Archbishop Charles Jason Gordon, on a couple of things, um, how he sees his mission as the head of the church in Trinidad and Tobago in the Archdiocese, as well as how he sees the mission of the church itself. Uh, before we get into that, let me just um, uh, sort of apologize to the viewers who would be looking for Arch, uh, the Shepherd's Corner in this time, uh, we want to suggest to you that um, this will take its place for the next couple of weeks as we go through the schedule in these discussions with His Grace. So we want you to stay with us for the discussion. Good to see you, sir. Good to see you, Andy. All right. Well, let me, let me start by asking you, so you've been uh, named as Archbishop in this Board of Spain Diocese uh, one a year now. How, let's talk a little bit about uh, between that time and now, how has it been? busy yeah. it's been full it's been rich it's been engaging it's been um, quite a stretch in, in so many ways I'm still the Bishop for Barbados or the administrator for Barbados so I'm in Barbados once a month um, so that means I'm only giving three weeks a month to Trinidad if there's no other travel to be done so it, that has kept me um, quite on the on the focus of what has to happen because this is a very big archdiocese. Yeah. 61 parishes, 256 mass centers, 118 primary schools, 21 secondary schools. That's not a small, a small number. Yeah. And some of your responsibilities span all of those things. Well, yes, all of that I, I, I am engaged in. Sometimes you're referred to as Archbishop of the Diocese of Port of Spain and other times as Archbishop of Trinidad and Tobago. Some people may need to understand you know, the, the differentiation, if in fact there's a differentiation. The, the, a, a subtle one and an important one. In the Catholic Church, we name the diocese by the city, the, the principal city of, of that country, or the principal city of the town or village or wherever the diocese is. Because if you go to America, no one bishop, and they have 200 and something of them could claim to be Bishop of America. <laughs> so just to keep it uniform, you'd have the, the, the Bishop of, of Port of Spain, or you might have the, or the Archbishop of, of uh, Miami, you might have a bishop in, in Fort Lauderdale, you might have another one in Colorado. So it's the Catholic Church, we name it by the principal city. Yeah, and uh, so it makes a distinction, let's say, with the, with the Anglican diocese, because the, the, bishop, the head of the church is the Bishop of Trinidad, Trinidad and Tobago. Tobago. Correct. Yeah. It doesn't, mean, yeah, it doesn't mean that that, 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 that um, responsibility is, is greater than the Archbishop of no, Port of Spain. Yeah. No, yeah. because it's the, the, bishop, the Archbishop of Port of Spain is responsible for the whole of Trinidad and Tobago, yeah. not just Port of Spain. What would you say has been your most uh, transformational experience since becoming uh, the head of the church in this diocese? I could name two. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, with the floods, that was that was really an amazing moment for me. I I think I touched Trinidad and Tobago at its absolute best. The the, the people came out. Um, people came out from every part of this country, every walk of life. People were helping in ways that were small and great. Um, I saw kind of a spirit in Trinidad and Tobago that reminded me of, of my grandmother's generation with that kind of generosity where they had no food in the, in the pot but a, a neighbor drops in and they're getting food too and that we're going to share everything we have. It also brought out a kind of um, a spirit in the country and, and a connection and a, and a communion in the country that, that allowed uh, 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 Trinidad to be something different from what it had become over the, the, the 40, 50 years before. And, and it was as, as if this thing that is really who we are kind of shined forth 
to be seen, and, 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 and that to me was, was one very powerful moment yeah. because it, 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 it did something to the country. Uh, and what, what um, a journalist would call a kind of aha moment yes. because we felt that we had lost that, and I think you probably yeah. would have um, been um, uh, misunderstood some months before that when you made a statement which was carried in the media as you saying we, too, we have become too stingy or something like that. Well, you know, that was a, a throwaway comment, huh? yeah. because it's, the question was a, a silly question. So I, I, I gave a silly answer okay. and they made it headlines. Yes. But I, so I learned from that experience, <laughs> no silly questions, no silly answers. So, so now I get a silly question, I just don't answer the question. <laughs> because I, I know that um, yeah. it is thing. But, and that was um, specific to the Venezuelan yes, and was. the refugee yeah. crisis because we, we had kind of closed. And although we've been incredibly generous to, to Dominica after the, the hurricanes there, for some reason the, the, um, the refugee crisis thing tightened us up considerably. Yeah. You think it's because of a lack of understanding um, um, and fear among us? You know, it's in a period when we feel that we're not doing as good as we should, and then they have to assume these greater burdens of people coming here. I mean, on, on not understandably, you know, this idea that they, they're going to come and take up our space and, and have take our women and yeah. all, all the, the litany of, of, um, of challenges that it brings. Yes, and I, I think. You know, in, in one sense, it's always much easier to do generosity when it's somewhere else. Yeah. But to open your home mm -hmm. is a different kind of generosity. So if, a, if there's a poor person down the corner, I could pass and give him sandwich and I could give him. But to tell him, come and live in my house, that's a kind of a disruption that is very, very different. And, and it requires a lot more thought yeah. and a lot more discernment. And, and I think. The, the refugee crisis has, has pushed on us to what are the real limits of our generosity? What was the real limits of our hospitality to take up um, Archbishop Emeritus Harris's big thing yeah. on hospitality? Right. I mean, you think that you, you've seen any, any kind of shift in our attitudes <laughs> over the, the intervening months to where we are now in terms of how we are prepared to, because you see in the people more, more and more people, probably not enough, yeah speaking out yes having a kind of embracing it's shifting it, it it is shifting um on on many on many fronts so i saw in the, in the newspaper today um a venezuelan couple he is a judge she's a professional living here painting fences and working as a security guard and talking about the experience now i don't know we'd have seen that so publicly in a newspaper um back yeah, some months, months ago. ago. Yeah. So it's starting to come to the fore. Um, as the, the Prime Minister and myself have had a conversation on it, and I think we found some middle ground where we can, we can move towards protecting the migrant and giving limited rights, and at the same time protecting the country and ensuring that, that we, we keep national security to the fore. So it, it's about finding these tight spaces where we can, we can negotiate and operate to allow the, the, the deepest part of our humanity to come to the fore. Yeah. Would, would, you, would you take credit for probably having nudged him? Because he, he said that in, you know, in, in what was carried in, in the newspapers, that after this meeting with you, he decided that the government should issue these special ID cards for Venezuelan people here, uh, trying to get uh, either refugee status or, or, or asylum seeking. You know, solutions are what people always want to find. And to find the right solution is always an important part of a process. Because the evening before, he had raised it in his conversation, saying that there, was, um, that, that there are jobs that Trinidadians no longer want to do. And, and if there are migrants who want to do those jobs, well, we should be looking at that. So it's not as if he, I, I, I had a closed door. Um, he had already started to rethink what was necessary. Um, what we had was a very productive conversation that allowed um, some new options to come to the table and, and, and that we could work together to find, to find those solutions. Yeah. All right. You mentioned uh, Archbishop Emeritus 
uh, Harris, some of them ago. I, I did, because he was working on, on a set of uh, programs himself, mm -hmm. initiatives mm -hmm. and ideas and so on. Yeah. Ha, ha, to what extent you've taken up some of them and then brought with you into the, your agenda now? So there are two big ones. Um, he wrote a partial letter on hospitality, which I think is a wonderful document. And, and this year, the church is focusing on the three H's, hymns, hospitality, and, yeah. and homilies. Yeah. And um, so we're taking up the hospitality from his pastoral letter and uh, moving it forward towards what we need as a, as a diocese. And, and, and that's why the, the work with the refugees is so important. That's why the work with the prisoners is so important. And that's the second one I'm taking up from him. Um, he had started this whole campaign to bring to consciousness in the country the plight of the prisoner, and especially those on remand yard. And, and those who, having spent five or six years, get their trial and, and get a sentence of three or four years. So they've spent more time in prison than the sentence would have given them, only because they're poor. And, and he had collected a list of names and got signatures and, and really started a movement towards getting this thing addressed. Um, so this is another one that, I'm, I'm, that I have taken up and, and that I'm working on. And that's why this week I'm going to go back into the prison to hear confession. And I'm going to go every month yeah. just to, to meet inmates and, and to listen, to listen, to listen, and be available. Because that was my second transformational experience, going into the prison and seeing the dark side of, of, of our reality that there are a thousand prisoners there who are in prison only because they're poor. So poverty has become the crime in their case. Because if they had the money, if they had a property that was free of debt, they would be able to get bail and be out of prison. So the crime, whatever else it, they, they are accused of doing, has really become poverty because after five or six years living in prison, you're a prisoner. And then getting a job after that, no matter what, because your resume has this gap. So yeah. no matter what you do. So this structure of injustice that is taking place in the country, and, and we all kind of blind to it and, and, and not willing to engage it or, or just happy until somebody in your family has, is in the same position, and then you understand how badly it works. But no, as a country, I think we can do better. And again, hospitality, again, humanity and, and it, it's really the darker side of our of, of our justice system yeah and in in the prisons and and among people who'd been inside and now outside there's an, a, a growing movement about what is called the people who are described as lifers yes and there's a movement to try and, yes. and get some understanding when somebody has done their time they have paid their debt when is life life yeah so when i went to the prison i came away with three major um things the, the first one is, is those on remand. And the 1,000 who have not been charged could have bail, but um, don't have the money. The, the second big one is the whole thing of, of the lifers. The, they, and, and a lot of them spoke to me, because some of them were sentenced to be there at least 20 years. Now they're, they're going on 25, 28, 40 years, and there's no intervention on, on, their, on their behalf. So that they themselves are in a, in a very awkward position because, you know, there is no end to this thing. And the third is the fact that the Mercy Commission Committee has not met and nobody has been released for 13 years. The only people released have been released because of very poor health conditions, but not because of good behavior. What that means is that a lifer who has just come and just been sentenced, looking on at the older guys, is going to ask himself, well, why am I going to be good? If there's, nothing, if there's no reward for being good, why am I going to be good? That puts an incredible strain. These three things put an incredible strain on the prison staff. Because now you have to find ways to keep these guys being good in the absence of any reward or hope at the, at the end. Yeah. And, and, and that, that creates a real dynamic in, in the prison system that makes it tough to do real reform. OK. So let's talk about some of your, your own, I, I would say, sort of, um, indigenous projects that you probably came into into the position with mm -hmm. what, are, what are some of those so i spent a lot of time in this first year listening to the parishes 
and listening to Catholic education. Um, and, and I mean significant hours and days in, in both areas. We did a pastoral plan, and the, the pastoral plan, so it, it took most of the year to do it. So it, it focuses on five major areas, um, the Catholic parish, the Catholic school, families, leadership in church and society, the parish, and the youth. What, what we've come up with is that our, our major objective is to bring the millennial plus generation, that's X, Y, Z, A, <laughs> to bring them to active participation in the faith and, and to facilitate them as a deliberate way forward. Because that generation has had the greatest change in the last 80 years. So even myself and those for 50 years before me would have had a similar sense of Catholicism. But between generation X, then Y, Z, and A, <laughs> they, each one has had very significant change because of the rapid change in technology. Yeah. And this rapid change of technology has driven a change in consciousness of the human. It has brought a change in how we, we see the world, how we communicate, of, the value system. So it's, it's really nearly a, a, a major rupture with all the things that you could have counted on from the past. Yeah. And, and to understand the pastoral challenge is to first understand how different the context is. And if you understand that this new context, which is, is still emerging and evolving and, and quicker and quicker, this requires, it's, it's like going to a new continent and discovering that new continent with a different language, a different mentality, a different experience. We, we have been treating our young people as if they are extensions of our old people <laughs> and us. And they're just not. And, and so this is really a primary missionary endeavor. And, and what we're saying is we have to do this through the Catholic parish, the Catholic schools, with the clergy and the families as a great support in, in doing this initiative. So that, and, and all of that requires leadership. So that's how we, we kind of pull together all the pieces. But, but we have to find a way to understand this, this brand and brave new culture of the millennial plus and really engage it deeply and no. profoundly with the wisdom that we have. Right, so how, how excited are you by what you see as the participation of the millennials as part of the church? The numbers have, uh, are encouraging, or is the needs work on that? Or? We have a significant number of millennials who are very committed to the church. And, and I don't think they're going anywhere, but I think if we don't do something very significant, they'll start drifting, because the, the church would, would seem less and less um, a home for them. But it's the ones just be, below that, Generation yeah. Z, which, which is born in uh, around 2000, 2003, they are the ones that are not seeing the sense of this thing at all. Because they are the ones who are saying, you know, why? Why? And, and, and then the older people with the catechists have been um, trained in very stock answers. But those answers are, are not touching this generation at all. Because they, they need an answer that goes at least three levels down. You need to be able to say, well, why? You say, well, because so and so and so. And, and this is because, and you go to the next, and then if they can't get that, that depth of answer, they're not going to even listen to you. And then whatever answer you give, you have to be able to model it by how you're actually going to be living and, and the way that you, your life is, is witnessing. Because if, if it's not getting three levels down and not being witnessed, you're not going to hear. Yeah. And, and that's, I think, the greatest challenge and excitement for me. Because I see, many people are saying, oh, this generation, no, no, no. For me, this generation is going to make us honest, make us Christian, and make us everything that we're supposed to be. And, and, and they excite me because I, I see that what they're asking of us is something we should have done out of our own accord anyhow. Because it's something called old-time discipleship. Yeah. <laughs> Live what you, what you talk and witness what you're preaching. Yeah. And, and that could, could be explained, and it's not inconsistent with the idea, because sometimes I think about it when it says that the, you know, the word of, of, of God is the same today as it was yesterday, and it will be uh, forever. 
-hmm. but as you're saying that there is need to to probably tweak is is is, is too fanciful no. a word no, to I'll make it relevant to so the, the the first reading from from the the um, third Sunday in ordinary time in in year C, which we're reading now, talks about Nehemiah um, reading the whole of the law, yeah. and then it goes on to say, and then he translated and gave the sense of the reading, and that's what we got. We have to, the law is the law, but we have to translate it so that this culture can hear it. We have to give the sense of it to break it down in a way that it could be heard and understood by the culture. And so for, for and, and that's, there's a big fancy theological name for it, hermeneutics, yes. the art of interpretation. Yes. But, but that's what we have to do. So we have done it fairly well for the traditionalists and the baby boomers. We yes. kind of know how to do that, yes. but, but we haven't done the, the translation and the sense of it for these generations coming. And that, re that requires a lot more work. And, and, and it is that work that we have to do if we are going to be able to, to find the bridge to the future of the church in Trinidad and Tobago. So, so, so how, to what extent there is a challenge in getting the, the, the teams around you spreading out to across the... the all the parishes to do that kind of stuff well, to be that, energized. To that's where we are now. Yeah. So um, we start. We had one an introductory um, meeting with the with the priests. We have another one that is coming. Um, we've met the heads of departments, and, and that was a two day meeting. So we really worked it through deeply with with the heads of departments, so they understand it. So that's people like family life, youth, communications, social justice, all all of our departments. But we've done something else too. We've brought into leadership um, young people. So we've, we've, we've brought in a millennial to, to run, to be the delegate for, for youth and young adults. Um, because I, I feel, you know, we, we can't have old people talking to yeah. young people and yeah. tell them. But, but we have to find partnerships. So it's not about now, well, throw away the old people and let's go with it. No, we have to find the partnerships between the generations to be able to, to pass on both the, the substance and the sense of the tradition to the generations that are coming. Yeah. But it is, um, it's going to take us a while. And I, I know that many priests and many parishes have already become focused on this from before. Uh, but it's now a question of how do we deepen this this focus and deepen this challenge. But, but more than that, how do we look at the whole of our parish? And how we do, do we look at the whole of our school? And, and, and ask a single question. How do these two great organizations contribute to the formation of the youth to be missionary disciples? And, and that's the real question that we, we have to push hard at. You know, where's your sense of, of enthusiasm or, or frustration probably in, in making a determination and the progress on that on that count on that score. So this this um, the pastoral plan kind of pulled together in December. So we launched it January. So this is really new. Yeah. Um, where do I see the pain points? You know that nobody likes change. <laughs> <laughs> nobody likes change. That's the truth. I don't like it. Nobody likes it. <laughs> Um, so that's one. But the, the other one, I would, I would say, you know, the, um, Jesus had his seven last words before he died. And, and I keep telling people, you know, the church has her seven last words and she'll say it until she dies. We never did it this way before. <laughs> <laughs> and so yeah. any, anything is, that is new is going to be a, a little bit of a challenge. And, and here you have so many, it's such a big, a big um, entity. When I was bishop in Barbados and in St. Vincent, and I was bishop in both of these wonderful countries. Um, the church is, is, is very small, um, seven parishes in, in each of those dioceses. I, I could gather all key people in the church in, our, in one room. We could have the conversation. We go back out, and we come back, and, and, and we could do lots more quick, immediate check-in and recalibration and go back again. And so we had a monthly meeting with our, all key people. And, and so the, the check-in and the recalibration happened on the fly. With 61 parishes, by the time you get the message to turn left, we've done three stops down on the train track. So it, it is how to think through 
the processes that we, we, we want to do in change and, and, and to put it in a way that we can do some incremental work in building foundations so that people don't feel overwhelmed by what, by what is happening and at the same time energized and excited to move forward. Yeah. Is it, is it too early after a, a year and a little bit to ask about what you may have ticked off on your, on your bucket list? Uh, so mission accomplished, mission accomplished. <laughs> Work in progress. Yeah. <laughs> Work in progress. So, it, a pastoral plan for the diocese tick. Yeah. Um, that was that was done. Um, spending. I said I was going to spend my first year listening, and I, I think I I really did that because I I was engaged both at a parish level, um, schools. I, I've, I've traveled the country in the in the first year and and tried to be generous in in going out. And, and seeing what the outlying areas are. I was in Tobago um, three times last year because I want to make sure that I, I touch Tobago because they always feel as if, well, you know, everything is a port of Spain or Trinidad. Yeah. But San, San Fernando feel everything is port of Spain <laughs> and they feel everything is Trinidad. So I want to make sure I get past um, the Carony, yeah, yes. I get past the lighthouse, I get past Aragua yeah, yes. <laughs> and the airport to, to, to really touch communities and, and meet people. And, and that has been a very rich and wonderful experience. Um, and I, can't, I don't want to say tick, because it is, I think that that has to be an ongoing experience and part of my ministry, to really be out there and, and, and reach to, and, and hear people in their own terms. Yeah. Um, what are the other, other big ones that we have done? I mean, there are some small things that we have done. Um, so Catholic education, we now have 19 projects that are not not small, um, that we are, we, are, we are evaluating and, and deciding which of these 19 go forward first, second, third, or not at all. And, and that's where we are with that. Um, and, and that's after a year of, of very hard work on Catholic education. I mean, there, there's a, a thing on, on using technology to, re um, to redo the classroom because a lot of our kids don't, Ken Robinson says, when children are interested, education happens. And a lot of our children are not interested when they go to school because what they're meeting is not interesting to them. And, and this generation is born with an iPad in one hand and an iPhone in the next hand, and, and they've come out with this technology thing. So this is something that we'll start this year as an experiment in, in um, working together with Nicholas Gomez, Lightbulb, who has this thing that is going already. Um, so we're going to experiment with that. We've, we've had a pilot last year that is ongoing for this year, so last semester, this semester, with Tim Conway. When a child comes at five years old to enter a school, if they come from a poor community, two things are, are, are challenging. First, they might not have had all the nutrition that was required for the development of the brain and the body. And second, they might not have had all the stimulation that is required for the development of the brain and to prepare the brain to be ready for language. So many children come at five with their brains not ready for language because of, of these two major reasons and many other smaller reasons. So Tim, Dr. Tim Conway has this method of teaching that changes the neural pathways and makes different connections in the brain so that it readies the brain for language and then it teaches children how to read without starting with alphabet. So it starts with, 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 with sound, with, with the shape of your mouth and recognizing um, sound, shape of your mouth and, and, and symbols. So it, it, it kind of opens the brain, the brain pathways to be ready for language and for numeracy. And uh, we're hoping, praying, he has the science behind this, that if this works, this could be, this will be one of the, the, the foundational things that we will do in terms of getting our children ready for language. And then you go to Jolly Phonics, yeah. um, where they, they're now ready, and then you take them to the next stage. And then, in, because so many of our children at CXC don't, don't know how to read and write, and far less for, for SCA, yeah. and far less for Standard 2. Yeah. They're not reading and writing. And, and nobody's asking the question, why are we producing so many people out of a school system who are not reading and writing? And if you can't read and write, you can't do, you can't do maths, you can't do science, you can't do English. There's a lot of things you can't do. Now, for me, this has been a, a major passion 
because I'm dyslexic, very dyslexic. I know it is the Gushua school system where you're struggling with language and, and still have to, to cope with everybody else. So for me, I want to, to ensure that the children um, get the best way to language first. And then that foundation, we build on that, and then education can start happening because now you have children's interest. When a child can't read and is getting buff because they're not reading, <laughs> what the child is going to do is lock off from school. Yeah. I, I could tell you how to do it. I yeah. could write the manual. <laughs> but so that's another. So the projects we're talking about are, are huge undertakings that if they kind of work together and come together at, at some stage in, in this, it, it would be revolutionary for education in our schools. Yeah. Well, that is what you just said there, that's, that's a, a profound introduction into the, this question about, you say, uh, but people aren't talking about it, and we're talking about education, but um, all of that you said there is contained somewhere in the report of this curriculum yes. committee in education, yes. which we've been talking about before yes. we came on the air. Yeah. And, and one of the things it says in there, uh, with reasons having to do with what you're talking about, the, the, the difficulties with, with, with learning language and learning to read and so yes. on, and the report sums up some of that to say that, well, you know, there are Catholic schools which are at the top of the heap in, in different parts of the country, yes. but there are others at that the are what they call this, 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 uh, this watch list of mm -hmm. schools that are not yeah. doing as well as they, they can. Good. Or and, they should. And, and now you have to map that statement geographically. Because the Catholic schools at the top of the heap are the, the Catholic schools in the Port of Spain area, and in, in some communities that are, that are thriving. Tabakit has done an experiment, and I, I love it. Um, they have taken hydroponics. And, and Lloyd Best said that sometimes school is pan, pan is school. <laughs> well, hydroponics is school, and, and, and school is hydroponics. Is hydroponics. Yeah. And, and the hydroponics, the kids are so excited about it that yeah. the teacher will say, no, 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 you have to do this exercise first, and then we go into the hydroponics or going to the hydroponics and then teaching maths and, and all sorts of other things, science and uh, agricultural science, all kinds of things. So it, but it has excited the kids. Our schools that are failing are mostly in communities that are failing. And, and the problem is, is like the, the, the drop of water in the ocean. If the ocean is, 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 is not healthy, the drop of water is not going to be healthy. So we're beating up on the school we have a bigger societal problem of the community. And then we have another challenge of the parenting styles in those communities. We are so negative in our parenting. We, 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 we correct people by shaming. But why are you so bad? We call people names that are, that, that are, that are insulting as pet names. And, and, and this whole negativity that the child digests from Nehai shapes the way the child sees himself. So we have to deal with the parenting. We have to deal with the wider community because if the children in that community who come out with some O levels cannot get a job, why is anybody going to struggle through education if there's no way out of that? So we have to deal with the wider community. Then we have to, to look at and, and see how are these communities being assimilated within the, the larger Trinidad and Tobago? So that project, and that's another project that we're looking at very se seriously. There's an East Port of Spain project that we now going to expand to all the, the schools we have in troubled areas to, to really take on this, this school as a learning environment to assist the community for development. Because unless the community is willing to be transformed and the parents are willing to be transformed, the children themselves will not have the kind of support that they will need to a future to make the sacrifices with education. Yeah. Um, something which you, you said there in, in, in that uh, response, the ways of, of parenting of, let's say, the 50s and, and the time when, when I was yeah. growing up, um, uh, no longer relevant. They're damaging. I, I don't think it's a question of, they pass the cell by date, <laughs> <laughs> and they're now yeah. toxic. Yeah. <laughs> they're now toxic. Um, and I don't want to go back to, the, to, to how we did it then, and, yeah. and, and the where's and why's of it, but, but now it, it is not, it, it damages children. And, and so it, it, it inhibits children from finding their truest and fullest potential. And, and, and therefore, 
we can't find a way, I don't know that we'll find a way in those communities without, without helping the parents. Gladwell did a wonderful study on, on failure and success in education across, yes, mm -hmm. across the, um, the, 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 the money line. And he said, you know, poor children and rich children came to the same school. And at the end of the term, they did as they did on the bell curve. There's no, there's no difference between rich and poor on the bell curve. They went home for holidays and they came back. The rich kids came back with increased learning. The poor kids came back dropping some of what they had. And then they went for the next term, now with this separation, went home for another holiday. And went home for widened. another holiday. The gap is widening in the holidays. Because a middle class or rich family is going to make sure that child is reading a book, goes to a camp, gets stimulation, does some learning, learning things. And a poorer um, community, what's happening in the holiday is the child is really watching television and, and doing nothing that is, that is really stimulating brain activity. And, and so the holidays is really where children, the, 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 where the money separates the education. But in the classroom, both, both work well. Yeah. But let's talk a little bit now about, about who Charles Jason Gordon is as a person. You, you know, your personality. A lot of people don't know, you know, a lot about who that, what that is. <laughs> Charles Jason Gordon is a sinner <laughs> yeah. who happened to be called by God to lead this church in this time. Yeah. Um, who, you know, really, my, my deepest sense of my identity is really as, as, a, as a person who God has loved for what reason I can't understand. And, and, but, but God has loved. And, and that experience of being loved by, by God is, is really where my defining characteristics are. Um, if you want to go more than that, um, I read widely. Um, I try to do at least two books a month. Some months I do that, some months I do three. Um, I try to read in, in, in very different veins, management studies, science, um, theology, spirituality, good novels. I try to take spectrum of, in, in the reading. Um, I, I love kayaking. Um, that's that's my, my go-to place when I have a, a, a morning with some, some time. I have yeah. a kayak in, in Karen, in, um, Kokorit and I would head up to the Hyatt or down to Five Islands. Um, I don't know. Not in this, uh, what do you call it, zip lining? And <laughs> no, 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 no. no. Um, the, uh, my, my life is, is, is pretty much a dedication to the church and to the things that are important for the kingdom of God. Um, and that's why, like, the, the, when, I was, um, when I was installed on the 27th of December, on the 20th of December, I went downtown to, the, to those living on the streets and, and spent my mornings there and, 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 and tried to understand what was happening with them. And I've had several meetings between St. Vincent de Paul and the mayor to talk about how can we work to move the, home, the question or the conversation on homelessness to the next stage. Because it's, it's, it's terrible in a society like ours that we have that kind of, 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 um, of, of challenge. Those are the things that, that really um, get me interested and excited. Yeah, one question. Um, how do you how do you separate you know, what, what you have to do in terms of you know, the, you know, meeting the ministries and, and try and read three books a month? <laughs> um, well, you know, I... So most of my, and I have to use in the scare quotes, most of my reading is done in Audible and Kindle. So it's always with me. Yeah. So I leave, as I did, um, to, to go to Kuva on Saturday. <laughs> That's a 40-minute read on the way and a 40-minute read on the way back. Because I'm in, I'm in my little cocoon, um, and I'm reading and thinking through what is being read. Yeah. So a lot of my travel time is reading time. Um, on an evening, if I have an evening with nothing, I'll do some reading there. Um, but so yes, I, I find my way to have the spaces to do things. But what I try to do is try to prioritize my time by the things that I consider most important. 
like, like um, there's a fight in the schedule, but I'm going to go to prison once a month for the next six months until I've seen, gone to all the prisons a second time. So I went in December, and I'm going to go again now. It's a fight in the schedule, but I do it. Um, spending time nurturing vocations with, with young priests or seminarians. These are things that are, for me, vital in terms of not only the ministry as an obligation, but, but my sense of purpose and vocation and, and, and my sense of what God is asking of me to do. Yeah, and it's not difficult to, or well, do you have to make an effort? I, I'm, I'm asking the question sort of rhetorically because I, I, I believe that you don't you have know, to make an effort to show what people genuineness. To, work is what you have to work at, you know. Yes. Things you love to do can't be work. Yes. And, yes. and most of what I do are things I love to do. And, and things, and, and the, the love comes from, from a sense of purpose and a sense of vocation. A sense of, this is what I feel God has called me to do. And, and so, because it's coming from there, it, it is really um, flowing out of something that I really feel passionate about. So it's going to happen, and I'm going to do my best at, at what, I, what I put my hand to. Yeah, becoming Archbishop of Port of Spain, becoming the, the, the leader of the church, isn't something that, that, that you know, somebody just gets picked out of nowhere, plucked out of, of anywhere. Uh, there must have been, uh, from your family upbringing, from, you know, what you would have studied, the, the things you would have pursued in the life, would, would that was on a, a sort of trajectory? Well, you know, I tell people that most of what I need in life, I learned in Fatima College. Um, we had a principal, Clive Panton, who really turned education into a very different thing. Um, he introduced an activity period on a Wednesday afternoon where you could go and do anything. So I did auto mechanics, I did plumbing, I did things that I was intrigued about. I wanted to know how an engine worked and why it worked. Um, but then I also taught life saving. And so in Fatima, I became a leader through scouts. I, I led the troop um, because I was a lifeguard. The groups couldn't go out to, to do field trips by the CNS. I was going with them. Yeah. Um, so that kind of shaped me for leadership and shaped me in terms of understanding how you give back and, and, and the way you, you live your life as a contribution to the bigger things. Yeah. And so I, all of that, I would say, was foundation. My family's foundation for that. Um, Mom and dad were always very keen in, in my upbringing, my values, my education. Um, I remember when, when I was 11, dad would wake me up in the morning to read um, nice children books because my reading was way behind and, 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 and that engagement um, really spoke about his commitment to me and, and, and his interest in my development and, and so my family, my, my um, the school, Living Water Community, which was the community I entered, was a whole other formation process that formed me with, with because I did so much social ministry, Marion House, um, Fountain of Hope, um, working with the people on the fringe of society, Duncan Street, that, that, that became part of my consciousness. So, so all these three big forces, the Fatima, my, my family, Fatima, and, and the, the community are really kind of what shaped me to who I am. Yeah. Um, Plus you, great education. You, you, you'd say that, and, okay. and you, you'd describe the education system so, overall in Trinidad and Tobago is great. So, um, well, my experience in Fatima was, was excellent. Um, they, they didn't know about dyslexia, and I still managed to come out with A-levels. That has to be excellent. Mm -hmm. um, but also, I, I, I did a, a, my master's in, in Belgium, in one of the, the big Catholic colleges in Louvain, and a doctorate in, in Heathrow College in London, the Jesuit school in the University of, of London. Um, so I've had great exposure to yeah. help me to be formed to do the things that I'm doing. Yeah. Um, you, you, you mentioned the dyslexia well, for the second time a while ago, <laughs> but you, you talked about how you overcame it, if, if that is the correct <laughs> term. And you want to share a bit of what happened? You sure. The, um, and I, I've done this with many teachers and, and uh, groups of teachers to help them to understand what it's like being dyslexic in a classroom. Um, so through Fatima, I made it through because the school saw me as valuable. And so that kept my self-esteem intact. 
because my, in the classroom, I was, I was very good verbally, but the exam, horrible. So the teachers saw there was something in me, but they didn't get it back in the exams. Um, because the language was not, was not clear enough, the handwriting was so terrible, all these other things. Um, but I made it through that. In, in seminary, similarly, um, Father Henry Charles saw something in my thinking that he, he thought was, was interesting and, and probed it and, and pushed me, really pushed me hard. Um, Austin Milner told me one day, you know, the only reason I bother to read your, your scripts is because I know there'll be something valuable in it, but it's a pain to read. <laughs> <laughs> but then after, once technology came, I use technology now for my, for my reading, my learning. So everybody knows me as a highly technological bishop um, because the technology became the substitute for the skills that the dyslexia um, has kind of inhibited in me. So the, when all your books came out, well, I thought I died and went to heaven. When Kindles came out, phew, this, is, this is wonderful. Um, a tablet where I can type rather than have to handwrite. All of these things kind of compensated for what I would have lost by, by being dyslexic. But there's, a, there's the opposite side. The dyslexic's brain has the problem solved constantly from seven and eight years old, because you want to write this word, but you don't know how to spell it. So what's the better word that you could write that you could spell? So you're problem solving constantly. So my brain developed this thing of problem solving. So you show me a problem, I'm showing you 10 solutions. People say, let's think outside the box. I say, what box are we talking about? <laughs> there <are> no box. <laughs> so the brain developed differently. So this next is only a problem really in, in secondary school, primary and secondary school. After that, it actually is, is, is a, 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 a boost and a help because the brain sees things so differently that, that I look at things and I look at it differently from many other people. Yeah. So have you been you, been able to had opportunity to pass th th that kind of orientation on to people who deal with, oh, yeah. with dyslexics? So many parents would just send their kids to me at different stages, and say, <laughs> and I would say um, if they're in my office, I say, you see that? What is that? Is it it's a certificate? What is it? So she's a doctor. It's okay. I'm dyslexic. Now I have that. Now let's talk about dyslexia. And then I, I'll, I'll tell them, and by the time I'm three minutes in, I've described to them what they're experiencing in the classroom. They relax. Because at last, somebody actually understands what I'm experiencing. And that for a child is miraculous. Because they, the thing is, you don't have the language to describe because the parent hasn't experienced that. And the teacher doesn't understand it. So the teacher is not helping. Um, today, we have a lot more support around um, ADHD, dyslexia, all these, these learning challenges. Um, in my days, it didn't. You, 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 you just grunted and, and, and you know, did what you had to do. Yeah. So I worked twice as hard as many of my friends. Yeah. Um, when I was in high school, that was in the, in the mid to late 1960s, mm -hmm. give you a sense of... <laughs> <laughs> just, just before me. <laughs> <laughs> but that time, um, you know, and there was a, 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 all this um, turmoil in different parts of the world and in, in the United States and there were these two Jesuit brothers, the, the Berrigan brothers. Oh, yes. Right. And, yeah. and I'm so reading a lot of stuff about them and the activism they were engaged in. And after that, I got the sense that Jesuits were at the top of the heap, you know, in, in the Catholic international, yeah, yeah, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. So when you said you went to a Jesuit university. I'm, two. Yeah, yeah. Two. Okay. Louvain in, in Belgium was a Jesuit university. Um, Heathrop in London was a Jesuit university. Yeah. And, and what is the special about, about the Jesuits that they, they become, I mean, activists and sort of the, 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 the conscience of, of the world in a lot of respects and the conscience yeah, of the yeah. church? At the forefront of climate change, of, of migrants and refugees, of, of all the big social issues. You'd find Jesuits there. I think that there, there are two things in, in it. St. Ignatius um, developed an understanding of how to help the modern person connect with God in, in, in as modernity had emerged with printing press and company. Um, and, and so his, his spiritual exercises really anchors people to the depth of the spiritual life, which is a new 
a new phenomenon. The Benedictines, it, it was an agricultural society, and, and it, it kind of just happened over time. Modernity disrupted it, and Ignatius was a gift that he brought, was, was this, this, these spiritual exercises. That, that is a kind of an anchoring and a consciousness that, that helps a person to, to really find their deeper center. And then he, he got them to study. So a typical Jesuit could be 15 to 17 years or 13 to 17 years before they finally profess. They do a degree in something, they do a degree in philosophy, a degree in theology, they go out and do um, something else, they go and do something else, they come back, they get ordained, they still do something, they still do something. Then th th there was a time when anything that the Pope wanted to know about anything, he'll call the, gen the, the Master General of the, of the Jesuits and say, I want to know about um, physics or chemistry or biology or medicine. And the, the Master General had somebody who was a leading expert in that field. And so no matter what the field was, because they had Jesuit universities all over the world. So Master General just call an expert in and say, um, we need to know this, and, and he will get it. Yeah. So they are intellectuals, but they're not intellectuals in an ivory tower. They're also, they're, they're also deeply rooted in, 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 in faith, in, in God, and in spirituality. And so they, they, they tend to be both at the highest end of the intellectual and at the, at the extreme end of the, of the advocacy for the church and for the poor, and for human rights, and for all these yeah. things. Yeah. Um, God willing, what are some of the, the, the parts of a legacy you'd like to, to leave uh, when, when that time comes, when you retire or... or, or uh, That's always a trick question, question when yeah. you have so many years to go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Education. Um, and, and I know that my predecessor, um, Archbishop Harris, put a lot of ed, um, emphasis into education. It, it really it triggered his mind. And, 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 and I would like to take that and carry it to another place so that we, we, we move the education system up significantly. Um, missionary discipleship, that, that we really address the, the challenge that many Catholics are, are experiencing of feeling on the periphery of the church. And, and that, that needs an addressing by a very good Jesuit model of getting people to spirituality and, and anchoring them in, in, this, in the core and center of their being where, where God is. And, 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 and then from that anchor, people will want to be engaged in the mission of the church. Um, what we've done for 50 years is, is kind of ought, should, would, and, and, and obedience, and, and shame, and pain. And, and that's not working anymore. It has to come from inside out. And that means we have to offer people a rich, complex, deep um, spiritual encounter with God, the formation, and the ways of living that, that go with that. And, and I think I'd like to see that. I'd like to see the, the millennial generation now um, much more active in the church, and, and therefore, in, in years to come, them passing that on to the generations that are coming come. after, yeah. so that we, we really have this conscious transmission of faith from generation to generation. And, and, and there are ways of doing that that you, you probably started to try and inspire. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Formation, formation, formation. So one of the things we're looking at for this year is bringing some millennials, hiring them through parishes and vicariates, training them in theology, giving them a formation, and at the same time having them doing the youth groups, the catechetics, the, the works in the, that kind of formation work in the parish. So that they have better, a better formation to help those who are already engaged in those ministries. Yeah. How do you respond to the people who continue to say, well, you know, the, the church has lost its place, the church has lost its voice in society? Um, people have a mouth, they can say anything they would like, uh, on one hand. We sin we're certainly not in the Fimbarian days where Fimbarian spoke and everybody got afraid. Uh, and I would not want to be in those days. Um, I think the power of the church is not in, in force or power. It is in persuasion for, for the sake of building a civilization of love and a, a humanity that, that is, is highly conscious of, of, of its, its vocation and highly conscious of what it is to be human in, in, in this era. 
And I think that that's where the power of the church is. And, and therefore, I don't see the power coming because you are archbishop. I see the power coming because you can persuade, because you can witness, because you, you, you can pull the best of the tradition to the fore and help people see the significance of our tradition for the current issues of our day. Yeah, at mass last Sunday, the, you know, the father uh, in, in Santa Rosa, he, he was making the point that he, you know, so he comes from Tobago, and he said, well, you know, to, the, the, this Catholicism in Tobago is, is, is not as humongous, not as pervasive as it is in, in, in Trinidad. When he came here, he found, you know, there's a Catholic community here that he yes. didn't understand, yes. but, but he found that doing some survey on his own that he says a lot of people, uh, you know, are Catholics because they feel that, you know, it's a prestigious yeah, organization yeah, yeah. in Trinidad. You could get something from it rather than contributing. Yeah. And, and that's what we have to change. People yeah. wanting to be Catholic, by their commitment to Christ. Right. Archbishop Charles Justin Gordon, thank you very much. Thank you, Andy. God very bless. Much. Good. Well, we hope you enjoy this. There'll be more to come with the Archbishop. Stay on this channel. <laughs>